Hi right, guys. Uh, we're going to talk about where I'm at with Stringier in general and resurrecting one of my side projects, how it's different and why. Um, this will be a general overview of where I'm at with Stringier, not any specific component. So as part of the V4 rollout, obviously auditing every single individual project uh, sub-project, library, whatever you want to call it. Um, the types, such as Rune and Glyph, are done. Uh, I'm glad to say that Glyph is done. The entire thing is actually open source now. Uh, there used to be a separation between uh, open source and closed source internals. Uh, the entire thing is open source now. Um, I had done that originally because I had some concerns about some very similar stuff appearing in some other libraries without credit. So instead of call out and maybe be wrong and have to deal with that whole social faux pas and everything, uh, just close source part of it for a while. If they are copying, force them to come up with their own implementation. If they're not, well, they just wind up with their own implementation anyways. Either way, it accomplishes the, you know, it addresses the concern. My code is not in other playables places on, you know, without proper citations. Um, no conflict, which is nice. Glyph has been reworked a bit, quite a bit, as far as internals go as part of cleaning things up and optimizing various things. Um, it uses a try now for its lookup. I know it, it, it used a, a dictionary, an associative array, specifically a hash table backed one um, before, but it's now using a try for the equivalency code lookups, which, Oh, there's some bizarre stuff going on there. But overall, it winds up being faster for the general purpose API and for the stand typical use case. So if both of those are faster, that's a good thing. Now, those are done. We've got encodings. Got, uh, did I have that as its own thing before? Oh, I don't remember. I think that was in core before. But it's been extracted out. Uh, it's its own little library, which helps with discoverability. Um, allows me to put specific encodings that I would like to see there. And it's convenient in that regards. In a similar vein, there's another Unicode related thing. Although technically encodings isn't strictly a Unicode thing, but obviously you're implementing mostly Unicode encodings. Um, but a closely related thing called categories. I have a write-up on DevToe about that. Um, I'm very happy, very, very happy with how that system turned out. But it's a structured approach to rich categorization. And it is fantastic. Um, to go along with that, literary had its linguistics component yanked out of it into its own library called um, linguistics. The orthography class that was you know, originally part of literary has actually become derived from categories now. So each category can, each um, orthography can be used as a category um, further richening the categories API, which is also fantastic. Um, there's almost no cost in doing that because it was largely setting that up anyways. It's just now we're derived from the right type to actually utilize that. So if you say wanted to do something like, I don't know, stripping out all I don't know, Russian letters from a English text, you could do that. I don't know why you would ever want to do that, but the convenient thing is 
that it's written the exact same way, no matter what it would be that you're stripping. Because these are declarative objects, so I can program them in a highly general way. Downstream programmer doesn't have to deal with the specific things. It just works. Program any category stuff, and it just works regardless of the category, no matter how specialized it is, even orthographies. Um, oh, categories also supports an expression syntax thing going on, uh, similar to the how the patterns engine uh, expression syntax works. Um, so you can build up uh, at runtime uh, or at construction time, depending on exactly how it can resolve things. Um, these expression trees that represent you know, well, it's set theory for the categories because categories are essentially a set. Uh, so unions, differences, uh, junctions, stuff like that. Um, are, are supported. And that would obviously then extend to the orthographies, considering orthographies are categories. Um, so you could get really specific. Like it, would be, it would be incredibly easy to actually do something like search through a piece of text and see if it has any Latin characters that are not English. Like that would be an incredibly simple line of code to write, but that's a remarkably complex operation. So that's that's you, you see why I'm very excited and very happy with how the categories API turned out. Um, to go along with that, Core has been getting a lot of work, a lot of lot of work. You can see some of the issues up on GitHub right now. They're rather major things, such as documenting in the function signatures whether a given uh, function allocates or not, depending on what its return type is, string for allocate, allocating functions, and read-only span of car for non-allocating functions. So that requires a lot of going through and auditing everything, but there's other things going on too. Uh, for example, adapting certain APIs to use the uh, orthography is when appropriate instead of just exclusively culture info. And there are actually some instances where it has to use orthographies because it can't use culture info at all. So if it can accept both, it has to use both. If it can only accept orthographies, it has to use orthographies. And <laughs> yeah. There's a lot. Core is taking a lot of work. Um, since I mentioned yanking out the linguistics part of literary and putting it into its own library, what's going on with the remaining functions that were in literary? Well, they're actually being merged into core. Uh, that work is already done, actually. So any literary specific functions are still going to exist in string or core. Um, there really isn't that many. I, I had kept it separate because I was concerned about code bloat, but there's, there's so little that it's fine to go there. Um, it's not really going to contribute much to bloat. Even with everything that's in stringier.core, it's a small library. So I'm not, again, I'm not concerned about the bloat at all. Um, obviously, given its status as the core of stringier, that means any work on the patterns or streams APIs cannot take place until core is finished. So, yeah, uh, that's that's fine though. I want there are ch important changes I want to make to core um, that affect patterns and streams. So that's that's totally fine. Um. One thing that did exist in core, uh, it's definitely possible not too many people recognized it, and I'm thinking about actually extracting this into its own API because there's increasing situations where well, that's what we're getting into. Um, having the right data structure helps your programming a lot. 
to some extent, this includes the stringier internals, such as that tri that is used for glyph. That's a specialized tri. It's not used, it's not like you'd find it in a uh, collections or containers library, because the way it works is so specific to that exact problem, um, which does conveniently mean it was relatively quick to write. But, but, there's plenty of much more general collections that I've been using extensively. Uh, and some of these are actually meant for downstream programmers. Uh, examples of that are sort of formatter analogs to String Builder. Um, I'd originally called it a format table and format list, but I'm going to be, in the, the V4 release, I'm going to be calling it list builder and table builder. And there, there may other be additional formatters uh, to go along with that. But they are collections. They are specialized collections, uh, just with the unique behavior of a two-string that does different stuff. Uh, but, but otherwise, they are collections. There's actually additional situations where I have collections that I would like to... Um, either have an easier time maintaining through better sharing between the internals, uh, things that I want to implement, but know that if there isn't that sharing, then it would be just too much, uh, stuff like that. And this should be sounding very familiar to a, a side project I had, Collectathon, which was a, more of an experiment than anything else. I didn't really intend for that to ever be a library, which is why it never went up on Nougat at all. Uh, just got written and then archived, and unlike some of the other ones that I had uh, done assigned projects, it never got deleted from GitHub because it was a successful experiment, but it was only an experiment. Now, I don't think it should be an experiment anymore, but I do think it should be tweaked a little bit, and I've been spending that most of my time today actually doing that. Um, so the original experiment behind Collectathon was to implement a containers API or collections API using as much sharing of implementation details as absolutely possible by combining um, object orientation, inheritance, and polymorphism together with CRTP or the curiously recurring template pattern which is a generics thing, which I've got an article up on DevTo if you want to read about that. I'd, I'd go for that instead of me trying to explain it real quick because it is a complicated uh, topic. But CRTP is useful for sort of degeneralizing what you get with polymorphism. It, it, they go hand in hand, but it is hugely useful once you finally wrap, wrap your head around it. Um, as well as implementing a collections API that actually had a distinction between abstract data type and data structures, which is important. However, it was that, the academic notion of these separated uh, abstract data types that actually got me into problems. So. Collectathon continued extremely successfully, uh, building up from this base class that all collections were derived from, no matter how they were implemented, to then increasingly and increasingly and increasingly specialized collections, which implemented more and more shared stuff. You should be noticing a problem, though. Collections are not taxonomies. But we are implementing a taxonomy. So that's one of the complaints I have about object orientation, specifically the inheritance side of it. Now, object orientation is fantastic for so many reasons. Uh, that's actually a huge reason why my um, patterns engine is as efficient as it is, as easy to maintain it as it is, and is as slim as it is. 
it's like a third of the size of Microsoft's regex engine because of object orientation. So I'm not bashing object orientation, but again, every tool has its, you know, it's what it's good for and what it's bad for. Object orientation assumes hierarchies, assumes taxonomies, but you don't always have taxonomies. What we do have is a system of similar things with common features. So we could do this through composition. I mean, it would work, but potentially. What's the composable units, though? And you sit there and think about it. And actually, there aren't really composable units. But there are traits. A trait wouldn't be flawless. You'd basically be implemented as an interface that has the bare minimum to support that. Every type that implements that interface that has that trait still has to implement that functionality, but because that is the bare minimum functionality, we are talking about functionality that can't be generalized and shared between the implementations. Or if they can, they are actually so similar as to be taxonomic in that specific area. For example, uh, list and uh, a singly linked list and a doubly linked list obviously share a lot of implementation details. Those different variations of lists could derive from the same taxonomy, but could a dynamically resizing an array and a doubly linked list share many actual implementation details? Not really. But what you can do is once you have those traits defined, start to write up generic extension methods which conveniently generics can have a type parameter be required to ha uh, derive or implement multiple interfaces, multiple traits. This works. Consider something like index of. All you actually need is for the collection to be enumerable and to be indexable. That's it. And even then, only read-only indexable. It doesn't need to be, uh, it, it, the, the indexer doesn't need to support mutations. You can implement that for every single collection that supports those two traits. And there are plenty of other examples. Uh, similarly, there are some convenience functions that can be provided through similar vein. Um, push and pop, for example, the stack operations, but that also apply to lists and plenty of other things. Similarly, the, the NQ and DQ, but we we'll do this example with push and pop. As a matter of convenience, it is nice to be able to specify push and then multiple things to push in sequence. Well, all the trait for pushable needs to actually be is the single push implementation. You can then implement a universal push for multiple by just simply iterating over the items you're passing into it, pushing each time. That works. Do the same thing with pop. Only in this instance, you're specifying an amount to pop off and then returning an enumerable of the elements. But now that works for anything that has the pop trait.
I don't know how far I can take that, but it's worth playing around with. And so far, with what I've got done today, I'm actually quite happy with it. Now, now, how does this play into string air? Well, remember, we're talking about a containers implementation whose goal is to provide as much sharing of code as absolutely possible. Then making it extremely easy to implement new collections or containers or whatever. Use that as the foundation for implementing the various uh, specialized collections that I need in Stringier. Hmm. That then makes it easier to also provide specialized collections useful for downstream, such as the formatter collections. What you see now. Luckily, this isn't too bad. If I can get anywhere near close to the amount of sharing that I had before, and I suspect I can actually get even better sharing now, then writing up entirely new containers was actually doable in 20, 30 lines of code. I'm not kidding. I'm not even close to kidding. And we are talking near complete parity to the standard .NET collections with like 20 to 30 lines of code because of the amount of sharing that I was able to implement before. So I think this will be worth it. I do. Um, as far as optimizations go, because obviously you want things to be improvable, we're talking about a high level of generosity, which I've also got an article about that on DevToe and why you should avoid that. So I'm taking a similar approach to how Link addresses this by the most general methods being extension methods, which are you know, incredibly general. They work for everything imaginable, but you can't make assumptions. And if you can't make assumptions, you can't optimize. But we don't even have to worry about increasing levels of specific extension methods. Instance methods are always preferred over extension methods. Want to provide an optimized implementation? Just stick it right in the collection that's uh, providing it. Boom. Done. Simple as that. That's where I'm at with this whole thing. Is it going to take a while to get to work over Collectathon? Yeah, a few days. That does give me a nice break for doing something very different than auditing, because I have been auditing for several weeks now. <sighs> it's still going to get done. I know it's for the best, but oh my god, is it not very enjoyable. So, give me some much needed brain candy, but it is directly and obviously useful throughout string year as well. So, be good for that. So, have a good one, guys.